slide there. All right. So our um, our apostle of note. Hey, Adam, could you close those blinds behind you? I'm getting blinded by the light. There we go. Thank you. Uh, is Philip the apostle Philip? Alex, can you turn me down? I'm I'm popping in my ear up here. Thank you. The Apostle Philip. Now remember Simon the Zealot uh, said nothing in Scripture. Remember that? Well, we don't have that problem with Philip. He doesn't speak as much as Peter. Um, but we've got plenty of material. And so really, when looking at, at Philip as an Apostle, uh, what, we, what you're looking for is not a single passage to unpack, like with some of the other Apostles, but we really get a composite of him because of all that he does say, especially in the Gospel of John. And so what you have here is a medal, uh, you know, a little coin of Philip. And uh, on the one side of him is his tomb, which is in Hierapolis. So we're going to start with tradition, then go scripture, then go application this morning instead of scripture tradition the other way because of Philip's tradition and what's developed about him from history, in history. So he is, uh, let's go to the next one. This is the, the building right here. Uh, 2011, like very recently, archaeologists were redigging and they found that image. Go back to the other one. Notice the same building on the coin. So they found the building on the coin. This is where his remains, this, his remains aren't there anymore, but this is where they were for about 400 years until they were sent to Constantinople in the four and five hundreds. And then after uh, the, the, go to the next one, Johnny. Then after the, the fall of Constantinople, his relics were sent to Rome, and they are there in the, the Church of the Apostles. That, that's where they've been for a long time. But this is in Hierapolis. Uh, for those of you that are up to speed, Hierapolis was mentioned by Paul. He wrote, uh, uh, when he was in Ephesus, he was there in Ephesus for a couple years. Ephesus was uh, there in the Lycus Valley in Asia Minor. And so the, the couple years he's preaching and teaching in the hall of Tyrannus, he starts sending out delegated, uh, he points people to go preach the gospels in the surrounding cities. Colossae, Laodicea, Hierapolis are all part of that area in the Lycus Valley. So Philip, for whatever reason, is in Hierapolis, and that's where he ends up being, being buried. Um, but he's known for, let's go to the next one. Oh, well, there's his relics with um, James. He's celebrated on the same day the church remembers James. I don't think I put a map up there, did I? No, you did not. I did not. So remember how Andrew goes into Ukraine and southern Russia. Uh, Philip goes to Stitia, and he gets up into those some of those more, uh, the steppe areas, for those of you familiar with that, the grasslands and all of that era. Like, he, he supposedly goes that far, but then comes back down uh, around Hierapolis there in, in Turkey today, Asia Minor. That's where he ends up being. Um, the martyrdom is tough. I was going to say martyr, but it's difficult because there are a couple different traditions, except everybody agreed he got buried in Hierapolis. Around 80 A.D., so he's one of the longer living of the twelve. Not as long as John, but much longer than Peter and Paul. And James, who's martyr, who's killed, you know, even in the book of Acts. So uh, let's let's there, there's kind of like what's happened over tradition. So let's talk a little bit about scripture. He is from Bethsaida. So Matthew eleven twenty, Jesus rebukes the people of Bethsaida when he rebukes um, uh, Capernaum. He says, Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And then Jesus will go on and he will rebuke Capernaum and saying, Will you be exalted into the heavens? No, you're going to come down to Hades. This is significant, not just because Philip is from Bethsaida, but because it's one of those northern uh, cities, northern towns, that is up close to Tyre and Sidon. 
And uh, we mentioned last week when Jesus feeds the 4,000, it's in that area, of that overlap area of the Gentile cities, and the, and the, the Syrophoenician woman, whose daughter Jesus uh, heals from the, a demon, she's from Tyre. That's where Jezebel was from. So Philip is from Bethsaida. Uh, you ever, when you ever see a Hebrew word, Laura, and you see the word Beth, it means house. House. So like Bethlehem, Bethlehem, house of bread. So the bread from heaven is born in the house of bread. Bethsaida is the house of hunting. So we don't know what they hunted, but it's the house of hunting. Uh, and Andrew and Peter are from the same place. So we don't have extensive records in the Gospels of all that Jesus does in Bethesda, Bethsaida, this uh, um, place of Peter and Andrew and Philip and who, how many of our other people. But we know that it's enough that Jesus is saying, if I did this entire and Sidon, if the prophets had did this, done this entire and Sidon, if, and as he rebukes Capernaum about Sodom and Gomorrah. And this goes into something that's very important for us because we have, we have been trained to think of God as, as a slot machine. That if we pray a certain way or we pray for a certain amount of time or if we give a certain amount of money or if we attend so many services a week, if we, if we fulfill some kind of religious obligation that God is duty-bound to us to give us what we want, not what he's promised. What Jesus is saying goes against a lot of the stuff that's being sung in a lot of churches today and a lot of stuff that's preached. Hear what he says to these cities. If what I had done in you, I had done for Sodom, Sodom would have repented and remained to this day. Meaning, God is the one who's active in redemption. He's the one that decides when he releases power. He's the one that decides who goes and preaches the gospel where. He's the one that organizes and orders all of that. We, and we have a responsibility. We have, we have moral culpability. We have to, to receive that grace. Okay, But the idea that we can generate and we can create and we can cause things to be because we want them is not true. Secondly, about this, this particular point here, it is not true that God does whatever he has to do to get someone to be saved. What? What did Jesus say? If I had done these mighty works in these ancient cities, they would have repented long ago. Meaning, I didn't do them. And they were destroyed. So your destruction on that day will be verified and confirmed by the people you condemn from the past. God is the one who's willing and working in the church, in the world. And it's a scandalous thing to believe that somehow we can manipulate him into doing what we want. Think about a lot of the preaching that's become popular. That if you... Um, let me make sure I get the, the, the phraseology here. Help me, Alex, if I get it wrong. You can have whatsoever you say if you say whatever you will. Is that how it goes? And they lifted out of Mark 11, where Jesus is talking about faith, and he's talking about prayer. And he's saying, if you, if you, tell, this must, if you tell the mountain to go throw itself into the sea, or if you sell the, tell the, 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 fig, the, the, the tree to go pluck itself up and go be thrown into the sea, then you will have whatever you say. I've always thought that was interesting because anybody who's ever pastored people knows that in the same pew, we don't have pews in here, so don't, this is not about anybody in here, okay? In the same pew, you can have two people praying for the exact opposite things, both being told that God will give them what they want. How's that going to work? One of them, at least, is getting a no. See, it's not consistent because we have made ourselves and our petitions, our passions, God, instead of God. And Jesus is clear here that this hometown of Philip received such mighty works that there would have been city-wide repentance greater probably than the likes of Jonah in these old areas. Also, of note here, Philip is not Hebrew. Like, that's... That's not a Hebrew name. Philip means lover of horses. 
So we don't know if the guy really was a lover of horses, or if somehow or another there's Greek influence in his family, at least because he's named Philip after Alexander the Great's dad, who conquered Greece, Philip of Macedon. So we don't, Macedonia, we don't know a whole lot about that connection, but you know how the people in the Bible have multiple names, Simon, Peter, right? Peter is not, is, is Aramaic or Greek, Cephas, right? But Simon is Hebrew. We don't know Philip's Hebrew's name, his, his Jewish name, his Hebrew name. So this, in my opinion, Aiden, this is just my speculation here, is because when John is writing his gospel, the people that would have known Philip would have only known him by his Greek, type, Greek name because that's where he was. They wouldn't have known him by another name. Why would you cite it some other way? All right? Amen. Okay. Let's look at some application here about Philip. And I, and I, I truncated traditional purpose because, as I've mentioned, there's a lot of biblical passages where he speaks. So let, we've got four of them. We're going we're gonna, to uh, we're gonna zoom over them, and then we'll, we'll narrow it down for some application. So let's look at Philip's call, and this is in John chapter 1. So if you want to open your Bible, if you have it, to John chapter 1. If you, you don't have it, that's okay. Um, I think you'll, you'll get the gist of it. But there's something really significant here uh, that I think speaks to our own experience in a certain way. In John 1, 43, the Bible says... The next day, this is after Jesus has spent time with Simon and Andrew and then Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found, he found, what did it say? He found, he found Philip, who was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. But if you look in verse 45, Nathaniel, I'm sorry, verse, yeah, verse 45 Philip found Nathanael, okay, so Philip goes and gets his buddy, Nathanael's Bartholomew, said to him, we have found. So Jesus goes and finds Philip, but Philip goes and tells his friends, I found him. We found him. If you remember what it was when you came to the Lord, it was very much, for some of you, like you chose to be a Christian. You found Jesus. Even the popular song, I found, oh, that's the wrong key. I found Jesus. I know you're clapping when you do it, right? I found Jesus. But really, once you have found Jesus, you realize he found you. And so you see that even in Philip's language here. Um, some, some commentators have kind of wanted to take him to task on this to say he's not that theologically astute. I don't think you should input that much theology into his statement as much as it is his excitement saying, Guess who we found? Right? Uh, but look at what he says to Nathaniel in verse 46. Come and see. Same thing that the cherubim say in Revelation. Come and see. Come and see. The living creatures. This, this word right here, come and see, is going to be characteristic of Philip's life in the Gospel of John. The next one, so that's Philip's call. The next one is Philip, I've called it Philip's capacity. So go to John 6. This is the feeding of the 5,000. John 6, verse 7. Philip answered him because Jesus said, Hey guys, feed these people. Philip, master of the obvious. Where are we to buy bread? Jesus says this to Philip. And what's Philip's response? 200 denarii, or like 200 days worth of work. Denarii is roughly what you would make in a day. So he's saying, you know, uh, uh, seven months, eight months. He said, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for, such, for them to get even a little bit. Master of the obvious. What does he see? He doesn't see enough. And he says to Jesus, too many of us live there. Too many of us live there. That's his capacity. The Lord, the Lord wants to do something extraordinary. Notice that Jesus feeds the 5,000, and in the other Gospels he feeds 4,000 as well. But there is no record in Christian history of anything on that scale ever happening again. 
There are miracles where food lasts longer than it's supposed to, sort of like Elijah and, and Elisha. There, there's things like that, but there's nothing where all of a sudden there's enough food for 15 to 20,000 people. It's 5,000 men, so they're not counting the women and the children that are present. So between 15 and 20,000 people, there's nothing in Christian history like this. This is a one-of-a-kind miracle. And the Lord knows he wants to do the miracle, something extraordinarily powerful. And Philip is not seeing it. But that's the point that the Lord is getting at. To get them to realize, stop living by this capacity that's in front of you. Because if you're only operating on the basis of what's in front of you, you're not looking at me and what I'm going to do. It's stunning because it's not like Philip just met him. There have been multiple miracles and signs and wonders already established. Jesus has already turned the water into wine. It's striking that Philip is not moved to believe that something can happen. Now, uh, Andrew, Simon's brother, you know, he goes and he gets his, the little boy's lunch. He's like, here's something. Like, at least he's saying to Jesus, hey, here's something, right? We saw you do something extraordinary. Here's, here's something for you. But Philip, let's focus on him, that's his capacity. So we've got a call, a capacity, his capacity. Number three, go to chapter 12, John. This is Philip's closeness. Remember that his name is Greek. It's Greek. So it's Greeks that go find him in chapter 12, verse 20. John 12, 20. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. This is after the triumphal entry. This is... Uh, that, that era of time between them singing Hosanna and shouting crucify him. The Greeks find Jesus. But they find him via Philip. He's close to the Greeks, but then he's close enough that he can bridge between the Greeks and the Lord. Tom Wright, uh, theologian, says the good news, because look at here in 20, 21. So those who came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida, in Galilee, notice how John says that again. He says it again. Remember, the Bible doesn't have exclamation points, right? So they want to emphasize something, they repeat it. So he's already said he's from Bethsaida in chapter 1. He says it again, pointing out location. Who was from Bethsaida in Galilee asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Remember, his name is Greek. That's not Andrew is not a Hebrew name. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus, and Jesus answered them, Okay, guys, I'll come visit them because I want the whole world to be saved. What do you mean, no? What? Oh, I was looking at the wrong translation in this passage. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. If they come and see me, the life of the kingdom that needs to go around the world will not go the way that it's supposed to be, and I won't be the seed that bears fruit. That's what he means. I have to die. They won't see me until after that. And they're not going to see me. Remember this whole thing about seeing? Show us. Come and see. What he, Jesus is saying they, they're not going to get this the way that you think right now, guys. If it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. There will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Take those two statements and put them in with what Jesus says in 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 chapters that we looked at last week. He's saying that the grain of wheat has to die. So Philip and Andrew are coming to Jesus because they're close to him and they're trying to get him to come and make himself known to these Greeks because, hey, look, it's time for you, son of David, to extend your rule amongst the Greeks. Go and take over Macedonia. Go and take over Alexander's empire. Go and take over the, this, this single horned goat that's come running out of the east in Daniel's vision. Go do that. And Jesus starts talking in riddles. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it doesn't yield the kind of fruit it should. Notice he says, if anyone serves me, 
He must follow me. You cannot separate being a Christian from being a disciple. To kind of t uh, connect that to our, our Sunday school lesson, you can't separate the Word from Scripture. You can't separate the Word from sacrament. You can't separate obedience from the Christian life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. In John 14, Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, so that where I am, there you may be also. And if I go, I will come again and take you unto myself. Okay? That is not about his ascension and his return to catch people up to him physically. That's not what he's talking about. If he was talking about that there in John 14, they'd have no clue that's what he was talking about. Because none of that existed in their minds. He would have been talking in a worse riddle than he is here. He's talking in John 14 about what he's saying right here. If you follow me, if you follow me, you will be with me where I am. Where was he when he said this? He was in Jerusalem. So he's not talking about geography. He's saying, I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, not where I will be, where I am, there you may be also. He says the same thing in seven, chapter 17 when he's praying. Father, I desire, I don't pray that you take them out of the world, but I pray that they may be with me where I am. What's he talking about? He's talking about a life of faithful obedience to him so that he and the Father by the Spirit can come and abide in us and then we abide in the life of God and relate to him in the Spirit. And when you put these things together, Philip has come to Jesus to say, hey, come and show yourself to the Gentiles, to the Greeks. And he's saying, a grain, the grain of wheat has to die. If, if you are not going to hear what I'm telling you, if you're not going to follow me, Bethsaida from Philip, the city that I had to rebuke, you're not going to be near me to hear and to be close to what I want to share with you. Again, some commentators like to look at this and reduce Philip's sharpness. I don't know, Johnny. I mean, I have a hard time saying that the, the apostles weren't bright personally. We get corporately that they miss it a lot. But I just, like one commentator said, he's the apostle of ignorance. <laughs> Guys, I mean, maybe you all have that liberty in the spirit. I don't. I don't have that. But it is clear, when you're reading the, the account, Philip categorically doesn't get it. And we're not done yet. <laughs> uh, but here's that quote from Tom Wright I mentioned. He says, the good news, the gospel isn't primarily about us receiving help when we need it, though that's included. Rescue when we're under intense pressure, though we get that too. Forgiveness, though we need it and it will be given to us as long as we become forgiving people. Or food for the growing, though that will be provided. It isn't primarily even about God's kingdom coming. The good news is primarily that God is being honored, will be honored, and has been utterly and supremely honored in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's what's happening in this passage with Philip. It's, it's Jesus saying he does what the Father wants him to do. And the very next account is when Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. And God thunders from heaven, I have glorified it, and I will. And then the people nearest Jesus said it was thunder. All of this to say that the glory of God is preeminently, categorically, supremely manifest in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And in nothing, and by nothing, and through nothing else can there be any confidence that it has truly been the glory of God. It comes through Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. And that takes us into... Um, the next point here with Philip in chapter 14, verse 8. Jesus has just told Thomas that he's going. And Thomas says, yeah, but like, where are you going? And this is when we get the I'm the way, the truth, and the life from the Lord. Well, 
Verse 7, if you had known me, Jesus continues speaking to them, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. And it is enough for us. And you can hear, you can hear, like, I don't think Jesus' answer here is, is biting or cutting. I think it's more shock, more like, uh, uh, not that Jesus is confused in the sense that Philip is, but he's sort of like, what? What are you? Have I been with you so long? And you still do not know me? And then all of you are hearing, if you don't know me by now, that's not what Jesus is saying. He's not singing that song. All right, Andy? Okay, all right. But you can hear the Lord, like the pang in his response. Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe I am in the Father is in me? The Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on the count of the works themselves. Philip, do not be like the city you're from. Believe me, Philip, on account of these works and on account of these words that the Father is dwelling in me and that the Father and I will dwell in you by the Spirit whom the Father will send in my name. I want to point out, because of Philip's confusion, it's been like, come and see. And he thinks he's seeing something the whole time with Jesus, but somehow or another, he's not seeing, even though he's seeing and the Lord doesn't, like, beat him up for his question. The Lord answers his question. Some of us never experience insight. We never get the revelation from the Holy Spirit that he has for us because we won't ask questions. Somebody in church probably told you you weren't supposed to ask questions and that your questions were stupid. Well, they might be. Anybody that's ever asked questions and then learned more realizes, yeah, that was a dumb question. But it's even worse if you never ask it. So you ask the Lord. You ask him hard questions. Ask him dif difficult questions. Pray like the psalmist. Pray like Job. J be ready. Just be ready. Because he may respond. Stand up, gird yourself, embrace yourself, and now you answer me. He may talk to you like that. He may talk to you like this. But he will answer the question. And depending upon the question itself, and if you seriously want an answer, see, that determines a whole lot whether God actually gives you the answer. Because a lot of people are looking for, for questions, or they're, they're giving voice to questions, not so they can obey God, but so they can justify their disobedience. To say, I'm not going to obey because I don't completely understand. Well, then you never will understand. And it's what's even worse, not only will you never fully understand, you will theologize, you will create an answer to justify your disobedience. Let us imitate Philip like this. So that even if we're asking the Lord something and he has to say, Have I been with you so long? At least we get the answer. And his answer calls us to himself. All right. I wonder, before we jump into the points of application, here's, here's just some, something for you to speculate on. You know, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John with him when he raises Jairus' daughter from the dead. Remember that? He takes Peter, James, and John with him when he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration and is radiant. That, that's a staggering, right? These three guys get a whole lot of this, like Jesus revealing glory like that. And remember, they are the rough and tumble fellas, the sons of thunder and Rocky. I mean, they are the, you know, we're going to just beat up people and call down fire because we like to be tough. And I mean, I just think that they probably had big red beards like uh, some people in Appalachia that I know. That, well, come on around here and I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I mean, that's just kind of the take I get from these guys. Philip 
maybe, maybe it's the lover of horses in his name. Maybe it's his questions. But I almost get the sense like he's, he's clean-shaven with a young face that says, Well, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus is just... Now, that's... that's right. But I, I wonder if, aside from all of that, if part of what is provoking Philip's question, his, his desire is that he's not been privy to that. He's not seen that glory. He's not seen that Mount of Transfiguration. He didn't see Jairus rise from the, uh, his daughter rise from the dead. He saw the, the changing of the water into wine. He saw the feeding of the 5,000. He's seen Jesus walking on the waves. So it's not that he's not seen the miracles. Hardly. Because Jesus says, believe because of the miracles you've seen if you can't take my word for it. But I wonder if part of it is this this innate jealousy that we read about amongst the disciples quite a bit, how they fight with each other over who's the greatest. And he's saying, you show us the Father. Like, if he's sincerely but misguidedly saying, give me a vision too. Well, you know God doesn't give you visions because you guys aren't spiritual, right? I'm using absurdity to display absurdity. That you're really a Christian because you have visions and dreams. You're, you're more spiritual. No, you're not. You're more accountable. You're more accountable. Was it, was it you and Gavin this week we were talking about, about prophets and about people who want to be prophets and they want to prophesy? Do you realize, because most of them don't, do you realize then that you are invoking, you are inviting upon yourself a greater level of scrutiny and discernment because you're claiming superiority to teachers. The scripture says many of you ought not to presume to be teachers because you're going to be governed with stricter judgment. How much more than those who claim to be prophets who are saying that the impulse that drives their speech is from God himself and God doesn't change. There is no fluctuation in his word. There is no variance in his decree. He doesn't decree one thing and then back away from it. And do not cite me the prophet Jonah one time in all of biblical history to justify why you're wrong 80% of the time. You have invoked greater scrutiny and judgment upon yourself. If you are a prophet, I'm going to give you some of the best advice you've probably never heard that you need to hear. Be quiet. Be quiet. If it's God, you keep a prayer journal. Don't put it on the internet. Don't publish books about it. Don't get up and tell everybody God spoke to you. Because if I break out a 10-year record of everything that God spoke to you, you've been wrong 60 to 75% of the time. And there's not a single prophetic voice that's promoted today in the culture that that's not the case. And in every instance where they've been wrong that way, guess what? They've got a justification as to why it didn't happen. I can list for you the prophetic leaders who in the mid-90s and early 2000s were talking about the great economic collapse coming from Y2K. Never happened. They were talking about California falling into the sea. It never happened. There are uh, scores of them. And I'm not talking about fringe leaders. Philip is saying, Lord, show us the Father. And Jesus says, what? come on, man. Like, we've been together for a while now. You haven't picked up on the fact that the Father is in me? If you want to see somebody that's living a prophetic embodiment of God's grace, look here at this exchange between Jesus and Philip. Is it the Word of God? Is it sure? Is it clear? Is it fixed? Is it immovable? Is it something eternal that doesn't fluctuate? Then it's the Word of God. If you can make it mean something else after the fact, it was your opinion. And hey, listen. Your opinions can be correct. Your intuition and your insight can be correct. That's, that's good, but don't call it the Word of God. There's a distinction we've got to have in the church. And here is Philip. Lord, I want to see something cooler than what I've seen. I remember first few months coming to the Lord. We're going to jump into the application here in a second. But after a few first few months, uh, I was reading the Bible, and I get to that account where um, Jesus is going back and forth with Herod in Luke's gospel. And Luke says, Herod wanted to see a sign. 
And the sense you get from the text is that if Herod saw Jesus do a miracle, he'd let him go. Well, if Jesus, I mean, now I can tell you that if Jesus had done that, he would have been considered a court jester in Herod's eyes, just another guy doing tricks. It's part of what's happening. But at the time, I thought, well, why didn't you? And then when you read in the account where, to the Lord, why didn't you? And then, then when you read where he's hanging on the cross, and they walk by and they wag their heads, right? If you're the Son of God, come down from the cross. Then we will believe in you. And I thought, Lord, why didn't you? Why didn't you just like whip your arm down, call down lightning, and kill them all right there? I'll show you. I mean, why didn't he? Like, and I'm, I'm reading them, and, I, and I'm not reading it like mad, because it's clearly in the Bible, so it's the Word of God, right? But, like, why doesn't he do that? Well, that, that same question is the same thing that Philip's dealing with. Why don't you show yourself to the Gentiles. Why don't you show us the Father? Why don't you do all these awesome miracles that we've watched you've been doing in such a way that everybody will believe? And he doesn't do it. This sermon is not about answering that question. I'm just bringing it up to, to voice it because we don't, we won't even say that to God. We'll turn around and we'll say that is what he does. It's a very popular song that he How's it go? He, he, he kicks down the mountains or climbs over the valleys and he chases me down. Not to Sodom and Gomorrah. Not to ancient Tyre and Sidon. Not to Rome when it fell to the barbarians. Not to what's been happening all across the world under, under uh, the Iron Curtain of Communism. But I want you to look at those places in history. I want you to look at what's happened in these places where they've said no to the gospel and they've beaten the church and they've imprisoned them and they've caused the body of Christ on the earth to suffer the way he did on the cross. And what has happened? Those seeds went into the ground and died and they borne forth fruit. So the church has become a juggernaut force in nations where the kings and the queens and the prime ministers have said no. Christ has said, I am the king. I am the Lord. And you will not forbid me. But if we act as if the only way there's spiritual power is through our manipulation of God's grace, we will never see the resurrection in our own lives. We have to learn that he is the Lord and not our paltry ideas. Let me conclude this morning. Simple questions for us. Simple questions. How did you find Jesus? How did he find you? And who have you said come and see to? Very simple. Just think about it this week. Secondly, are you living by your limited sight? Are you permitting the lack of what the Lord is showing you? Because notice Jesus shows him the great crowd of people. And he says, feed them. Jesus shows him the problem without showing him the solution. Are you letting your lack, your inability, determine what you obey and don't obey? Have you grown to perceive that the lack is because there is a vehicle that God wants to use, that there's a means to release provision, to release grace, to release power? But he's not going to do it if you just say, 200 days worth of work wouldn't take care of this. Go steal somebody's lunch, preferably little kids. <laughs> no. Thirdly, are you a bridge builder? Are you close to the Greeks? Are you known by a name amongst them so that you can take them to Jesus? Because as much as the text emphasizes how Jesus doesn't go and greet them and spend time with them, it points out that there was thunder from the sky and it was because they were looking for him. God was not ignoring them. He was not ignoring them. But he wasn't going to give them what they wanted when they wanted it. Are we pooling people? Are we bridge building amongst people who don't know the Lord and people who do? And then, here's lastly. Are you seeking what's plainly in front of you? A lot of people pray for things. Most prayers petition. They're always praying for something. And very often, God will give you exactly what you asked for, but it doesn't satisfy something on the inside like you think it would. 
And so you're discontent with his answer. You're discontent. You're upset that he gave you what you sought out. And so then your life becomes one of complaint while you're looking for something different. And he did for you exactly what you wanted. Philip is saying, show us the Father. And Jesus is saying, that's all you've ever seen. What visions, dreams, or prophecies, or miracles are we looking for, are we praying for, when Jesus wants us to see that he's right here at the table? Right? Let's chew on those. Let's think about those. Let's, let's meditate on that whole form, that whole question of, Lord, show us the Father. And he's saying, haven't you seen me? Haven't you seen me? To know that it's the Father working in me. We're going to conclude this morning with the prayer that we pray on the feast day of Philip. And as I mentioned, his, his, he doesn't get a feast day all to himself. He is celebrated on May the 1st. Some church calendars, May the 3rd, but May the 1st. This is him. Um, this statue is from, I think, the early 1700s, and you can see his foot on a dragon because one of the much later traditions developed that, it, that he killed a dragon. So when they did the statue, the artist made it more like a snake because that's like it's realistically probable that he did kill some kind of animal that wasn't a Lord of the Rings dragon, but a Komodo dragon. <laughs> Uh, but then you can see the misshapen cross because he was supposedly crucified. There's a couple different accounts, but like very high up. A cross like this, the one the Lord was crucified on, was maybe this high off the ground. Like you could, if you're tall, you could reach the top of the cross. Like you're just barely up off the ground. It's not a big, long pole. Right? Philip supposedly was. Like he was elevated very high. And there's some accounts that say it wasn't just high, his body was turned in a crooked way. Not upside down, but crooked. And so this shape of the cross has been associated with him. Would you stand with me? Almighty God, you gave to your apostles Philip and James the grace and truth to bear witness to Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life. Grant that we, being mindful of their victory of faith, may glorify in life and death the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.